<laughs> it's good to see everybody here today. Uh, what I would like to do, and, and I'm going to sing a sing a direction song that since we're from all coming from all different directions together today, I thought that'd be appropriate as we get started. And I have a few words following that, and then I'll close with another short song. And so this song will go to the four directions, to Mother Earth and to the Creator. Hey, oh, hey, oh, wabanunge, ni minigawas, me gwetch, ne abjinamawa nom gom. Hey, oh, hey, oh, jawanunge, ni minigawas, me gwetch, ne abjinamawa nom gom. Eo, eo, nin gabianang, ni minigawas, mi gwetch, ne abjinamawa nom gong. Eo, eo, ki wednange, ni minigawas, mi gwetch, ne abjinamawa nom gong. Eo, eo, wagonem daki. Unga Gwenachi, Zaga Iwe Win, Ni Minigawas, Mi Gwetch, Ne Abjinamawa, Nom Gong. Eo, Eo, Gichimani Do, Eo, Eo, Nishpaming, Een Dot, Mi Minigawas, Mi Gwetch, Ne Abjinamawa, Nom Gong. We ask the creator to be with us as we go through this day today and be in our hearts and minds, be with all those in our, in our communities. We ask a special blessing on all those who are ailing in body and in spirit on this day and with their caregivers. Ask the creator to reach out and touch them and give them the strength they need to get through this day and through the challenges in their lives. We ask a blessing on all the warriors who fought to help protect all of our peoples and all the veterans who may be wherever they are that recreate their reach out and touch them and help bring them peace in their lives. We thank the creator for the, for the infants and the youth, the middle-aged, the old-aged, all around that circle of life that we, we really appreciate all of the teachings and all the blessings that we have in our lives. Miigwech, 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 miigwech. And now as we get ready to journey on through this day, I thought I would sing a, a canoe song. It's a, it's a short song, but it's a song that you would sing while paddling a, a jimon or a canoe. And it, I thought it'd be appropriate for this travel that we're going to be taking together today. Jimonananana nodin, jimonananana gigon, jimonananana nodin, Jimonananana gigong, Jimonananana nodin, Jimonananana gigong, Jimonananana nodin, Jimonananana go. This song is uh, my canoe. It's like it's like a fish. My canoe is like the wind. And I thought that would be a good song to carry us through as we're working together. So with that, I close my opening blessing and I wish everybody well as we go through this day. Aho. Thank you, Frank, for opening us in, uh, opening the side event in a, in a good way. Thank you very much. Next, I, I, it is my pleasure to call to the floor, Ms. Anne Norgan. Um, Ms. Anne Norgan is from the Sami people and is, is the chair of the UN Permanent Forum of Indigenous uh, Issues. Uh, Ms. Norgan, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, hello, good day, everybody. Indigenous sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the United Nations General Assembly has declared 2022 the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. Uh, aquaculture. 
celebrating uh, the inter in International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture uh, in 22, will give uh, recognition to the millions of small scale fishers, fish farmers and fish workers, and also to the indigenous peoples who are fishermen and who work with fishing. The indigenous people's culture is based on the free use of land, water and natural resources. In the context of the Sami people, our main traditional livelihoods are reindeer herding, fishing, hunting and wild berry picking. The indigenous and traditional food system of the Sami people depends entirely of these traditional livelihoods, thus maintaining them is vital for uphold traditional food system. The traditional Sami livelihoods are practiced sustainable way and let the, the nature restore itself. Reindeer migrate from different grazing lands to another. Fish population is not traditionally overfished and game populations are maintained in carrying capacity to ensure food for coming years. Various factors, principally environmental changes caused by competitive land usage and climate change are decreasing the key food resources as practicing and maintaining traditional livelihoods and traditional knowledge become more challenging. Berries and mushrooms depend on climate. Climate change has negative impacts to reindeer herding, hunting and fishing. Some changes in seasonal, seasonal calendar have occurred. That falls are longer and the falls are longer and spring, spring arrives earlier than before. And also the winters are milder. Uh, I'd like to share a practical example of the effects of the climate change to our culture. My home river, the river Tietnu, in Finnish it's Teno and in Norwegian Tana, is the largest, largest Atlantic salmon river in Europe. In 2017, uh, the both Finland and Norway ratified Tietnu Agreement, uh, Tietnu Fishing Agreement. This Tietnu Fishing Agreement regulation, regulates fishery rights, fishing quotas, and fishing techniques, techniques in my home river. And uh, so it, it protects and preserve, uh, preserves salmon stocks in the entire river system. But la lately, the uh, salmon stocks, the Atlantic salmon stocks have been steadily decreasing. Uh, so the, there were needed some measures to protect the mm, salmon. Uh, and my people, the Sami, we have been living in the area since time immemorial. Uh, and we have stated that this agreement violate, violates our fishing rights our right to culture as indigenous peoples. Because in this uh, uh, agreement, there are no uh, rights recognized to Sami people as, as such. Uh, although we have demanded our rights to be recognized in the same manner that they are recognized in the constitutions of Finland and Norway. And uh, for example, the Finnish constitution recognizes Sami peoples a right to practice their culture. And uh, for the summer, next summer, 2021, the governments of Finland and Norway have proposed a total salmon fishing ban for all fishermen uh, in order to protect Atlantic salmon. The Sami parliament of Finland states that this total salmon fishing ban violates the Sami people's right to uh, our culture because it denies completely the inland fishing for the Sami and thus uh, uh, prevents us practicing completely our culture. So this is at the moment one of the, uh, the issues negotiated between the Sami parliament and the Finnish government to see and in uh, we'll, we are going the governments, governments of Norway and Finland are going to decide this later uh, before the, uh, the 1st of May. But uh, um, for us, this is a question of our life, our um, rights to practice the culture. So therefore the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and aqua Aquaculture is an important step 
state, taken by the international community to, to recognize indigenous people's fisheries and food systems and the connection between indigenous people's food security and collective rights to lands, territories, uh, and natural resources. And the permanent forum, we appreciate that the FAO hosted an expert seminar on traditional knowledge and indigenous people's fisheries in the Arctic region in 2019. The seminar highlighted the need to support and strengthen indigenous people's fisheries and indigenous people's knowledge related to fishing. Uh, considering the global challenges of climate change and loss of biodiversity, environmental degradation impacts to our marine ecosystems and the potential for diminished of indigenous knowledge related to indigenous fisheries, hunting and subsequent impacts upon the intergenerational transmission of indigenous knowledge. knowledge. We hope that the indigenous peoples and our traditional knowledge is included in the celebration of the year next year. To conclude, I would like to welcome the very recent fisheries agreement reached between the government of Canada and Listugui Mi'kmaq government. This landmark, landmark agreement was reached in a spirit of collaboration and a, as an example for the rest of the world. The purpose of the plan is to advance reconciliation in the fisheries. It, address, it addresses areas of mutual respect and will support the Listikui Mi'kmaq capacity to participate in the fisheries. With the goal of economic self-reliance by obtaining additional fisheries access, such as through licenses and quota, and establishes a co-developed and collaborative approach to fisheries governance. This kind of agreement is an excellent example of good practices and demonstrates how indigenous people's knowledge on fisheries can be incorporated in, in, sorry, in the state's government system. I wish you uh, successful discussions for this uh, side event. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ann Noggin. Uh, thank you for sharing your, your personal experiences with us. I know you are one of the busiest people during this uh, UN Permanent Forum. We would love for you to stay uh, for the event, but we understand if you have to go to attend other events. Thank you so much. Um, before we begin with our esteemed speakers, I would like to share some housekeeping rules uh, for the session. To all uh, participants, we encourage um, the participants and speakers to edit your Zoom name to include your organization and your, and your name. As mentioned uh, at the start, all observers, uh, please turn off your video and mute your sound. For questions to the panelists, we encourage you to use the chat. Please begin with the word question in front so that we can easily distinguish uh, questions from comments. I request to please be specific, concise, and direct the question to the person uh, who you wish to ask. The agenda and biographies of the speakers will be posted in the chat as I introduce the speakers. We would like to record this session. Please let us know uh, if there's any problem in doing so. Uh, to the speakers, small request, please keep your camera on uh, when, when you are speaking, if possible. Uh, I will give you a prompt, a voice, uh, a voice prompt when you have run over time, if you don't mind me doing that. If you have any technical issues, please contact my colleague, Luisa Castaneda, by sending her a private message in the chat. I would li now like to call Ms. Nicole France to the floor. Nicole is the Equitable Livelihoods Team Leader of the FAO Fisheries Division. Nicole, Nicole your, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anandi. And uh, it's my pleasure and my, my honor to, to be with you here today, uh, this morning or this afternoon or this evening, depending where, where you are joining from. Um, I will give you a very brief overview of some of the global uh, frameworks that are relevant for indigenous inland fisheries um, before we, we hear more about the real experiences from, from our distinguished panelists. Um, let me briefly say an historical moment where we really have a lot of global momentum, a lot of attention fisheries and um, 
it is also important to note that small scale fisheries uh, and also artisan includes also artisanal fisheries, marine and inland fisheries, and this also includes indigenous fisheries in this very broad category of small scale fisheries. So one of three major developments that we um, we can refer to in relation to strengthening small scale fisheries. One are the so called small scale fisheries guidelines. Um, this is an international instrument that has been uh, endorsed by the FAO Committee on Fisheries in 2014. And it is a result of a very long and participatory uh, development process. That was really a bottom up process, including also uh, representatives of indigenous peoples. So this is a, is a reference framework that has been endorsed and, and that we have all available as international community as guidance reference framework uh, since 2014. In 2015, the, the new framework of the sustainable development goals approved. And within that framework, green in italics, because um, this is obviously a limitation to what we're talking here about, but what we are doing as FAO, we're the custodian for the indicator for this, uh, this SDG target, is to encourage countries to also consider the same target also for inland fisheries. And lastly, what brings us together here today also is the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, that will be celebrated uh, in 2022 uh, under the lead of FAO. I would like to briefly uh, tell you a little bit more about these small scale fisheries guidelines. This is quite a comprehensive document that brings together responsible fisheries management, but also more holistic uh, development, including chapters, for example, on social development, employment and decent work, on climate change uh, and disaster risk, and also on gender equality for the first time in a, in a dedicated fisheries instrument. These small scale fisheries, fisheries guidelines have a number of guiding principles that cut across the whole document. And there are specific references in here that I just wanted to highlight that refer to specifically indigenous peoples. So you can see here, um, one of those is a principle two on, on respecting cultures. And you can see that here, it specifically refers to also including indigenous peoples and ethnic minorities. Um, similarly, uh, the principle number six on consultation and participation calls to ensure active, free, effective, meaningful and informed participation of small scale fishing communities, including indigenous peoples, taking into account the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And throughout these small scale fisheries guidelines, uh, there is specific reference to the rights uh, of indigenous people. So I encourage you to, to learn more. About this, and I will share the link to this document later. These guidelines are important for indigenous peoples because in the hundred paragraphs of which this document consists, there are a number of provisions that speak specifically to the recognition of customary tenure rights. And these are particularly important, obviously, for inland fisheries and in the inland um, indigenous fisheries also. Um, these guidelines uh, value the promotion of traditional knowledge and they call for the involvement of decision making of all in planning, in implementation and in monitoring of activities. And I also have um, highlighted here that they also call on gender equality in different cultural contexts with the prefer preferential treatment of women and indigenous peoples. So again, I invite you all to, to learn more about this instrument if you didn't have a chance yet to do so. Um, on the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, I would just to briefly introduce you and let you know that we have a global action plan that was just endorsed by the International Steering Committee of the International Year on the 30th of March. We're now finalizing it and it will be made available on the website. This, this plan has seven pillars that you can see on the lower part of this, um, of this uh, slide. On, and, environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, social sustainability, governance, gender equality, food security, nutrition, and resilience. And all of these 
pillars obviously are highly re relevant also for indigenous peoples and this global action plan also specifically refers to to indigenous peoples across the different proposed activities that are in this plan the plan will be available in the six official languages uh, of fao and again we invite you to 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 use it and to refer to it and and to help put it into action um, in in the next year this brings me to my very last slide the conclusions uh, as you can see there is global momentum for small-scale fisheries at the moment the global framework is for action exists. What is important to consider though is that inland fisheries in general is often left behind in discussions around small scale fisheries and related activities. It receives less attention. So there's a big issue. Similarly, indigenous, uh, indigenous fisheries are even less considered. It's often small scale fisheries, often people think and work and, and, and pay attention to the marine and the oceans. Uh, so there is, there's a big responsibility for all of us to correct this and to make sure that in the celebrations of next year, the indigenous inland fisheries is, is fully included and we all take advantage of this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, for that and giving us an overview. It is now my pleasure to invite Mr. Jon Fernandez de, de Laranoa. Jon is the chief of the FAO Indigenous Peoples Unit. Jon, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, uh, Anandi, and thank you, Nicole, and allow me to, to thank, of course, uh, Anne Norgan, but also Frank, uh, Dale, uh, Paul, and Lisette for being with us today here. It's extremely important, and I'm very happy that we are doing this very important event together. Allow me to share my, my screen. I, I, will try to, I will try to be uh, as short as possible because I think it's very important to give the space to our colleagues. Can you see my screen, uh, Anandi? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about the global hub on indigenous people's food systems and why it is extremely important that we put uh, uh, fisheries at the front front at the at the forefront of this of the work that we are doing through the global hub. Um, FAO uh, has a work program with indigenous peoples that was drafted together with indigenous leaders in 2015, and uh, besides free plan informed consent, indigenous women and indigenous youth. One of the most important issues that we were requested by indigenous leaders was to work on indigenous people's food systems. And this work has been going on for several years. Already in 2004, the voluntary guidelines on the right to food highlighted the importance of land territory for indigenous peoples to have uh, the right to food and their food security guarantee. In 2019, 2013, uh, FAO partnered with McGill University to analyze different indigenous people's food systems. And many of them were fisheries food systems practiced by indigenous peoples. And this for an organization like ours that is very much linked very often to agriculture, it is extremely important to have fisheries uh, devoted the necessary attention within the food systems debate. Um, I will skip this slide because already Anne and Morgan talked about the Arctic uh, high level sen uh, expert seminar we have on indigenous peoples and Arctic fisheries. It was extremely informative for many of us. And we learned about how many Arctic people are actually practicing the food systems of their ancestors. Now, FAO is a knowledge organization. And over the years, there's more than 70 technical publications about the indigenous peoples. And several of them are about fisheries. We have, for example, analysis of fisheries in the Amazon River in different countries. I really invite you to uh, link uh, or to, to press that link and everything is part of the public service of the organization. All the publications and materials are available to all of you and they are free of charge. Now, indigenous people's food systems, why it is so important? What, when we launched the Global Hub on Indigenous People's Food Systems, what we wanted was with indigenous leaders, scientists, research institutions to create a knowledge platform that could bring together all of this knowledge under the principles of co-construction of knowledge, but more important, giving respect to indigenous people's knowledge at the same level as any other knowledge, particularly scientists. And this is a major breakthrough because for many generations, uh, scientists have been neglecting and marginalizing indigenous people's food systems. Now, the Global Hub is a collective effort 
Uh, we are very honored to have among us the Sami parliament uh, from Finland, but also different indigenous organizations like AIPP, as well as uh, universities and research institutions. And this is what is unique about the hub, the sharing at equal level and equal level of respect of the knowledge that each of the partners brings to uh, the discussions. Something extremely important is that the Global Hub will be contributing okay. to uh, provide inputs to the United Nations Decade of Action on Nutrition, to the SDGs, but very important also to the UN Food System Summit that will take place uh, at the end of this year in 2021, and where again, fisheries needs to be on the front front. There's a number of uh, activities that the Global Hub is doing, but let me skip that. And uh, the Global Hub was agreed uh, through consensus at the high level expert seminar we did in 2018 with experts from all over the world. And again, my thanks to the fisheries unit and the fisheries division where Nicole is working because they had been a fundamental ally on all the work that we are doing on indigenous people's food systems. What are the next steps? Well, the Global Hub is drafting collectively a white paper, a WIPALA paper on indigenous people's food systems. This has received more than 50 contributions from all over the world. And it has been already accepted by the scientific group that is informing the UN Food System Summit. So this is a very important contribution that indigenous peoples will be making to the summit under the principles of respect and co-creation of knowledge. We are releasing a publication in the coming weeks. Uh, it's about the indigenous people's food systems. And uh, here you can see um, uh, at Ikuna Kokamayawa and later said will be sharing with us some of the work that she has been doing in the field with this, uh, with this uh, community in uh, the Amazon River in, in Colombia. These are the different sites that have been already um, uh, analyzed and we have done that with a, with a plethora of different organizations. And some of the other ones that are ongoing, we continue the research with different institutions across the world. Now, um, um, already Anne Norgan talked about uh, the Inari Sami food system in Finland. We cannot uh, overemphasize the importance of fisheries in this system. 70% uh, of the households in the Nelin region still eat in a traditional way, and fishing is, is one of the main activities that ensures the food security of the community. Actually, in the, in the Inari Sami language, they even have several uh, terms and several normal, in, their, in their language, several terms that allude to the behavior of some of the fish that they interact with. And this is what is so unique about the indigenous peoples and their food systems. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the Tikuna Kokamayawa because I know that the Lisset will be uh, sharing with you uh, a lot of the information that she has. So with that, I would like to close my presentation thanking you for the opportunity. And I want to take the opportunity to thank Nicole and her unit. Very often, in FAO, there is a very large organization where we are asked of a model of collaboration with a technical division. We always say that the way we work with fisheries is the way to go. So thank you so much, Nicole, for the constant, the constant support and for putting indigenous peoples at the front line of the work that FAO is doing on food systems. Thank you, Anandi, for the use of the word. Over to you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you for your concise uh, presentation and both to you and Nicole uh, for giving us an overview on the work uh, done by FAO. We now enter the panel discussion with our ex esteemed Indigenous experts. I would like to request all the speakers to give us their insights on the importance of inland fisheries with Indigenous peoples' food systems and their territorial, territorial management practices. But I will also ask specific questions to each speaker. First, we have Dr. Dali Sambo Doro. Uh, Dr. Doro is Inuit from Alaska, currently serving as the international chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. Dr. Doro, my question to you is, as the international chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council and active member of the UNCCC, the UN Climate Change Conference, LCIPP, which is the Local Communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform Focus Working Group, what are some of the key factors about indigenous inland fisheries and climate change that you would like to see influence the global debate and propose actions coming out of the, UN, of the 2021 UN system, Food System Summit and next year at the 2022 International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture? Thank you. The floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. I have um, prepared a brief PowerPoint presentation, and uh, now, given the time constraints, I'll I'll skip over a number of the slides. But I would like to um, respond more concretely through the through the PowerPoint presentation that I have. We can see your screen then. Thank Perfect. You. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, apologies in advance if this is a bit disjointed. I was uh, invited to join very late and uh, hope that this uh, resonates with the participants here. Uh, I wanted to share this slide in particular because it's an example of an Inuit food system. It's from one of our regions in Northwest Alaska. And uh, Anna Norgum uh, spoke about the diversity of um, species items uh, and in particular uh, fish that they rely upon. Uh, this image is um, based upon uh, work that's been done in Alaska about what supports uh, Inuit communities, in this case, seven communities, and the diversity of both terrestrial and marine um, resources. Of course, uh, throughout the Arctic region, there is a use of Arctic freshwater as well as diadromous fish, those that um, uh, live part of their life in, the, in, in saltwater and uh, also in freshwater. And this is the majority of um, the fisheries for our communities. But we encounter numerous problems in terms of the, the use of those resources and the imposed regulations that have been brought by the colonial forces that have grown up around us. And some of these um, uh, uh, words here express the difficulties that we have as far as management of uh, the resources that we depend upon. Across Inuit and Inuit, it is very uneven. Anna spoke uh, about an example in Canada and the uh, greater recognition and respect for the rights of indigenous peoples and their food systems, including inland fisheries. For us, it's very uneven from uh, Chikaka and the Russian Far East to Alaska to Canada, as well as Greenland, where there's extensive um, control and management of the resources, both for, for hunting, fishing, and harvesting, but also for commercial purposes. Of course, external pressures and changes are being uh, affected, um, and the, the uneven and, and lack of coordinated approach to these questions uh, create challenges for Inuit across our homelands. There is a lack of genuine co-management. Oftentimes that term is utilized for, uh, for um, uh, various different food uh, resources, uh, but it is rare that it actually takes place in a collaborative and cooperative fashion. There's also a lack of recognition of a holistic approach, meaning that uh, managers, especially state managers, or I should say just generally public government managers, state managers and federal managers, they see species uh, in, in a silo and never recognize the holistic approach that indigenous peoples carry forward in terms of their profound relationship with the environment. I won't go through this long list of the impacts of, of climate change. This is an area that um, is uh, important to indigenous peoples across the globe, but for us in the Arctic, which is warming uh, more than two times uh, more rapidly than other regions of the world, this is a long listing and it's not exhaustive in terms of the impacts uh, throughout Inuit Nunat, our homelands, uh, triggered by climate change. And many of them are devastating and of course impact our food security. In addition, uh, for especially um, uh, fisheries uh, in the marine environment, uh, the impacts of uh, Arctic shipping are, are dramatic and very real. We've been uh, uh, monitoring and observing uh, impacts uh, out on the uh, coastal seas, but of course, everything is interrelated and um, the watersheds are impacted and our fisheries are thereby uh, impacted by uh, the activity of Arctic shipping. 
Quickly turning to uh, the indigenous peoples within the UNFCCC question that you've asked me specifically about. Here again, I won't go into the long uh, details. Indeed, uh, individuals like Frank who offered us the um, opening ceremony uh, just a few minutes ago uh, has had a longstanding history of involvement. But just quickly, uh, Inuit and other indigenous peoples were involved in Earth Summit. We started to recognize the impacts of climate change. And uh, there's a long and detailed history about our involvement because we began to see the impacts of climate change um, decades ago. Here, I'll just underscore that there have been uh, over 60 decisions adopted by the Conference of the Parties specifically um, as well as the subsidiary bodies specifically related to indigenous peoples and indigenous knowledge. So this is a this is an area where um, there is again a long history of our, our direct involvement in order to influence climate change policy. These are just some images of our colleagues um, uh, within uh, the Conference of the Parties 25 and, and elsewhere. As far as key messages of Indigenous peoples, and I think this is something that should be looked at as a possible example for uh, the FAO, is um, uh, the embrace, the full embrace of Indigenous peoples. I know that the FAO has done extraordinary work in this area, and um, my main message is that the, the, the voices and the key messages of Indigenous peoples should saturate the whole of uh, the FAO, including the forthcoming uh, Global Food Systems Summit. I won't go into this uh, uh, indigenous peoples platform in an in-depth way, but what is significant about uh, this new constituted body, the facilitative working group uh, within the UNFCCC is the fact that there is equal representation between states and indigenous peoples, but even more significantly, the indigenous peoples without any state member party oversight have the ability and the capacity and the authority and the mandate to select their own representatives. In contrast, for example, we heard from Anna Norgum as the chair of the Permanent Forum. Her nomination by Indigenous peoples and the advance of her name had oversight. In contrast, within the uh, UNFCCC, it is Indigenous peoples who determine by and for themselves their representation within this particular platform. The result, the facilitative working group, which was to operationalize and realize the place of Indigenous peoples within the UNFCCC, is again the first UN constituted body with equal representation, but also significantly respecting the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And again, Indigenous representatives able to self select um, their specific representatives. The objectives of the facilitative working group are to emphasize knowledge, and in this case, obviously, indigenous knowledge, to increase and enhance our capacity for engagement, but also recognizing that we can enhance the capacity of state party members, uh, and of course, to focus on climate change policies and actions. I'm abbreviating a lot here because of, uh, because of time. Uh, thus far, the facilitative working group has put in place an initial two-year work plan. Uh, there's a host of different activities, but I want to highlight uh, activity four, of which I was um, a, a co-lead on behalf of the Arctic region for, in collaboration with the Government of Canada, focusing on increasing the capacity of state parties in the area of Indigenous knowledge trying to gain recognition of and respect for indigenous knowledge by state parties, but more specifically to ensure that state parties and others ethically and equitably engage indigenous knowledge and not simply treat it as something that can be dumped into a, um, a portal and um, uh, grabbed and utilized out of uh, context, but real genuine respect for what Indigenous peoples have to offer, not only to the questions of climate change, but a whole diversity of issues that impact us as distinct peoples. 
Um, here again, I won't go into um, uh, this long listing, but I think that for purposes of the FAO, for purposes of this question of inland fisheries, uh, understanding um, how we ourselves as Indigenous peoples characterize our own food systems, recognition of a rights-based framework uh, for Inuit and Sami food systems, uh, recognizing the role of Indigenous knowledge, also understanding that we need rights safeguards in relation to Indigenous knowledge, my desire is to ensure that FAO and indeed every UN um, every UN agency and specialized agency removes this false dichotomy between the developed and the developing world in the context of indigenous peoples. For example, in the United States, I live in one of the most affluent countries on earth, yet about 44 of our communities in Alaska do not have potable water. And this is a problem when we begin to see this false dichotomy in operation within the United Nations. I would also like to uh, ensure that there is no continued conflating of the term indigenous peoples and local communities, largely because indigenous peoples have advocated since first contact um, for recognition of their distinct status as indigenous peoples and in every context, including the FAO, I think this is a crucial element. Finally, a key recommendation from the Arctic region is to ensure that there is some kind of a structure, institution or platform uh, for Arctic indigenous peoples within the FAO uh, to ensure that we have an opportunity to introduce our specific uh, views and perspectives about our food systems and ensure that they gain uh, the recognition of uh, the FAO as a, a global institution focusing on food security. So Kuyanak, thank you very much for this opportunity and sorry to have uh, gone over time. Thank you, Dr. Dara. Uh, thank you for your excellent intervention. I will now call again to the floor, Mr. Frank Etawashik. Sorry, Frank. Um, I'm not forgetting your surname. Um, Frank, from your experiences and leader, uh, a leadership regionally and internationally, how do you see indigenous people's governance shaping water systems resource management? And what opportunities do you see to expand the influence of indigenous people's governance systems in the management of watershed natural resources, including that of inland fisheries? The floor is yours. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Yes, I'm. Uh... Uh, I appreciate the, the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I've got a slide on the screen right now that is the, uh, it shows the Great Lakes. Uh, just to get some scale or in, in your mind, uh, if you drive from the southern part of the mitten down by Detroit, the southern part there, all the way up to the northern peninsula and then all the way to the end of the Lake Superior, it's about an 18 hour drive. So it's a long, uh, it's a long drive. It's a great distance. These are big lakes. And uh, you see the background behind me and my picture, but you also, let's see here, we have this. this. This is that same shot. And this is an example of the lake. These are, these are inland seas. They're huge lakes. And these are the lakes that my people live around. Uh, and we have lived here. We're, we're we're, as you heard me sing the canoe song, we're canoe people. We've fished on the Great Lakes. We fish in the inland lakes inside, in, up in the, in the peninsulas and in the rivers. Uh, we're, it's, a, it's a really big part of who we are. And we realize, and I think part of this is to, is to, look, at, uh, is to look at the idea of, uh, uh, for us, the, uh, when we, when we were uh, signing treaties, for instance, and here's a list of the eight principal treaties in the state of Michigan, and the blue area is the Treaty of Washington. That's the area that I live in, right up the tip of the lower peninsula of Michigan is, is my homeland. Uh, and when my ancestors were working to sign treaties, uh, we didn't look at the water and say, those are our fish. When we reserved fishing rights, we weren't thinking of it as property. 
We weren't thinking of the fish as property. Uh, however, as we've tried to protect those treaty rights over the years, the courts have had to interpret that and they have interpreted it as property. So consequently, they've ruled that we have a certain percentage of the fish from the lake in terms of property that, that, we, can, that we can catch. Uh, but when my ancestors looked at the water, uh, they reserved the right to fish. What did that mean? Well, what that meant was, is they reserved the right to sing for the fish, to dance for the fish, to pray for the fish, to catch and eat the fish, but to have a relationship with the fish. In other words, the fish are our, relate, our relatives and we take care of them, they take care of us. We have responsibilities to them and they have responsibilities to help feed us. And we we share this, this world and we have this, uh, and it's not just fish, but it, it ends up being all of creation that, that, that this kind of, that this view of responsibilities have. And so what we've maintained is that our treaty rights are actually relationship rights, not so much property rights. They are property rights, but they're not property rights in the way we think of it, because we think of it as relatives. So we all know that our food comes from the land and the water and that they're inseparable. Uh, you know, they're interconnected and inseparable because what happens on the land affects the waters and what happens in the water affects the land. So because the fish, our fish are in the rivers and they're in the lakes and they're back and forth between them. We have salmon runs, freshwater salmon runs here that, that come out of the lakes up into the streams, the same with, with other types of fish. And so as, our, as, as my people have worked on this, we fought hard to protect these rights, these relationship rights. And that has, we, we're in a little bit different situation than some of the indigenous people in other places because we've gone to court and have these court established and, and, uh, and litigated and have these, uh, these rights that are there. In the inland waters, we have a permanent consent decree in the US versus Michigan fishing rights case on inland hunting, fishing and gathering. Uh, and so the state conceded that our right exists forever. We made a few concessions in, the, in this agreement, but we established how we were going to co-manage the fishery. So the tribes in the Great Lakes, uh, particularly those in the, in the treaty of, in, in the, the lower peninsula and upper peninsula, the blue area and the, and the purple area up in the upper peninsula, these, uh, these tribes have all, uh, have uh, natural resource departments, have fishery biologists, we have conservation officers, we have tribal courts, and we, we monitor our own citizens. And we also license our own citizens in terms of the catch. We work together with, with the state and with, uh, with the federal government and determine what the total allowable catch will be through, through uh, fish sampling. And we figure out what the populations are, figure what the total allowable catch is. And then that catch is then uh, split by uh, these consent decrees in terms between the sport fishermen and the, and the commercial, I mean, and the Indian fishermen. Now, we have a lot of native people, myself included, who uh, who fished you know most of our lives and I can say that I have never sport I've never fished for sport and most of our native fishermen had never fished for sport they fished to eat and there's a difference because we're honoring that relationship we're not just not just fishing as a as a sport and so to me this is this is an important part of that and going to that question about how are we how are we helping to manage? Tribes in our areas have, uh, we, have a, we have about, uh, uh, I think there's six fish hatcheries that are run by the tribes. Uh, my tribe one, runs one, and then there's two or three others in other areas around it in the Upper Peninsula and just in Michigan on the Great Lakes where we're, we are raising uh, various types of fish. We're trying to help restore fish, for instance. Uh, there's a, there are fish that are, uh, the, the Arctic grayling, for instance, is a fish that used to be in Michigan. It was everywhere. It was the main the big fish here. But after the state was logged, 
the the silt in the streams changed the habitat to where they could no longer be there. And so uh, we're trying to restore those fish into the streams. And there are several different uh, efforts to do that. We're also working to protect and, and restore the, the, the sturgeon. There's some pockets of, of lake sturgeon that have been that have continued to survive, but we're also trying to increase those and plant them again in rivers and lakes where they had not where they have had gone away. These are the kind of things that we're doing in terms of protecting our, our relationship. Because what we know is, is that that this, this tie that we have that goes to the lake, as you see, it's, it's you know, what it is, is they say that, that you know, we, the, the, without water, we can't live. They say that water is life and all of the different things. Well, that, that's so true in terms of how we, we recognize and understand our relationships. The inland fisheries of the Great Lakes are, are vital. We have commercial fishing, we have subsistence fishing, we fish with nets, we fish with hook and line. We sometimes fish, uh, I haven't done this myself, but I know people who have gone out as the suckers were spawning in the spring along the shore and they were able to reach right down and grab the fish right by hand and throw them up on the bank and, and catch fish in order to, to, to can or to put away to eat. This is a big issue for us. Uh, the climate change has been another issue that we have to pay very close attention to because as we negotiated on the settlements on the treaty rights, we had to not be species specific because the, the species that live in our lakes are evolving and changing because as the warms, species are moving north and some of the species will move right out of these, some of our lakes. Uh, whitefish, for instance, were within one degree uh, of Lake Michigan no longer being a natural habitat for the whitefish. So I, I realized that in the limited time, it's very difficult to get a great deal of this, but I wanted to give you just a, a, a brief talk about what it is that we've done, what we're trying to do, maintaining, thinking about climate change, co-managing the resource, our relationship to the resource. When we look at the resource, we don't think of it extractively or transactionally, we think of it as relationships. We help the fish, the fish help us. We, we were important to each other in order to survive. And so I think that's an important thing. And I know that as I talk with other indigenous people from all over, not just on inland fisheries, but in the, in the oceans, they have a similar kind of feeling. And that feeling has to be captured as we get into the into the into the thoughts about how do we deal with the, with the small scale fisheries and particularly with indigenous fisheries, is this is such an important part of who we are, and that you know we aren't as we as as I've heard some of the fishermen say, you know we are the fish, the fish are us, we are together, and that's an important thing for us to think about. So I I look forward to questions later, and I'm. I realize my time is, is pretty well done. So thank you very much. Thank you, Frank, for, for keeping to time uh, and your very insightful presentation. Thank you once again. Our next speaker is joining us from Thailand, Mr. Paul Sin Thua. Mr. Paul Thua is from the Karen people and is founder of the Kesan Indigenous Organization. Hello, Mr. Thua. My question to you is, your organization, Kesan, works closely with the Karen people who carry out biocentric restoration or conser uh, conservation in the Salween River on the border of Thailand and Ma Myanmar. Please give us a brief description of this important work. Um, my second question to you is, the, as the world is watching with interest the events folding, unfolding in Ma Myanmar, please give us an insight on how the Karen communities are coping with this conflict and the militarization of ancestral territories. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ananda, for the opportunities. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, maybe let me um, start with the uh, kind of uh, overall um, 
kind of uh, framing of my uh, presentation, um, sort of uh, provide the, uh, the our indigenous no, current uh, worldview about uh, fisheries, about uh, uh, land and, and, and waters first, and then uh, let me uh, share with you about uh, the current uh, uh, experiences, the, the um, what's going on now. Yes, and, and, and thanks very much to uh, Frank, who really has speaking uh, really uh, about the indigenous people experiences. And I think uh, his presentations like uh, reflect a lot of, of my people. So, you know, even I don't need to present uh, and uh, share our experiences. Thank you very much. So let me start with uh, a poem, uh, our Karen Ta. Uh, we said that uh, in Karen, we said, Pooti bagato ti, pooko bagatoko, kato o litu lito, sunya kamitimuko. This can be translated as we who drink water must take care of the waters. We who eat from the land must take care of the land. Only when we maintain this balance will our well being be sustained. So this tar poem presents two core values. Holism and balance. These values are ever present in the daily lives of indigenous Karen and have for centuries been at the center of our stewardship of our territory, our ancestral territory uh, in Eastern Burma. Indigenous Karen firmly believe that our own health and prosperity is inseparable from that of the natural world around us. We have a duty to care for the animals, plants, mountains, and forests as members of our communities and to afford them the same respect we give each other. So similar to Frank, uh, what Frank has said. The Quran have a holistic worldview. Everything is interconnected. Complex systems bonding together people, nature, and the spirits living within. This is reflected in the traditional core management system, which comprises simultaneously an ancestral territory and the lives, livelihoods, and social structure of the community living within its boundaries. Flowing through all of this and bonding it together is water. Water ceremonies play a key role in natural harvest and planted seasons and communities regularly meet on the banks of the lakes and waterways to hold prayer ceremonies and celebrations. The health of local water systems play a significant role in the prosperity of local communities. And it is not uncommon for communities from several core territories to work together to sustainably govern ponds and waterways. This includes the creation of fish breeding zones and the institution of local rules and regulations on fishing, planting, and clearing of certain trees and access to riparian areas based on seasons and the natural life cycles of local wildlife. Korean communities use their indigenous knowledge developed over generations to pursue adaptable and sustainable livelihoods and aquacultural systems that promote a healthy natural environment. Thus, inland water sources and waterways both support livelihoods and promote good relations and effective cooperation between communities. Uh, my organization, Kaysan, has worked uh, with uh, several village communities in our territory, helping them to record the traditional rules and the regulation for their fish conservation zones and to map their territories. Since 2017, we have worked with uh, about 15 communities uh, comprising more than 600 households who are seeking to strengthen the, their fish conservation zones or establish new ones. The majority of these fish conservation zones are located in watershed areas and make a vital contribution to the health of the landscape area. 
community members have told us that after establishing the fish conservation zones, they saw the water quality in the area improve significantly. And the populations and size of fish outside of the zones also increase. These zones have also contributed to the protection of watersheds as local rules and regulations have often stipulated that surrounding vegetation must be left intact to protect the waterways and provide safe areas for fish to spawn. Communities have begun to discuss the establishment of uh, limited use of fishing zones where conservation and sustainable use are brought together. They also plan to establish a larger learning and communication network to bring together scientific principles and their indigenous knowledge to build uh, resilience for the ancestral territories and livelihoods in the face of the growing global climate uh, emergency. In Mutra district, this is being facilitated by the Salimin Peace Park, a community governed indigenous and wildlife conservation area that was established in 2018. At the core of the current approach to water is the promotion of life. Water and the biodiversity living within it give life to current communities and it is thus vital to return that favor and protect them for decades. Though Korean communities have had to face up against the Myanmar government and military who view water only as a source of profit. Projects such as the 1,200 megawatt Haji Dam uh, planned on the Selvin River, uh, one of the last uh, free flowing rivers in Asia and a life bluff for Korean people and the ecology of the region. This project threatened irreversible damage to the sustainable fisheries and fish conservation zones of thousands of Korean families with no benefit in return. Unlike Korean approaches to water sources, these projects through ideas of holism, balance and life out of the window in favor of revenues. They have also acted as a flashpoint for conflict which has seen a resurgence since the Burmese military stole power in an illegal coup in the 1st of February. In contravention of the 2012 bilateral ceasefire agreement and the 2015 nationwide ceasefire agreement, the Burmese army have been conducting widespread targeted attacks on civilian populations. On the 27th of March, 2021, a series of airstrikes were launched against villages in Mutra district in the Seven Peace Park. This has been, all of, has been also followed by a large influx of troops into indigenous Korean territories and the firing of mortars into villages and agricultural areas. It is currently estimated that uh, about 40,000 community members have been displaced from their ancestral homes. While there is a coordinated effort by current civil society and local government to support uh, communities who have been forced to flee their homes. There is also growing need for regional and international support. It is vital at this time to condemn the actions of the Myanmar military and to support the efforts of legit legitimately elected government representatives and uh, civil society, especially those from ethnic governance organizations and ethnic communities. We Karen have faced over 70 years of war and the challenges of changing global weather systems brought about by the climate change. Throughout these times, in the face of such adversity, ethnic Karen communities across our ancestral territories have continued to nurture and protect our lands, waters, and forests. Indigenous knowledge offers an invaluable perspective on the integration of conservation and sustainable stewardship in the governance of inland waterways and their watersheds. The current communities of Gothule, our ancestral territory, demonstrate uh, practices and livelihoods that are sustainable, egalitarian, adaptable to new scientific developments and resilient to all kinds of pressures. 
we all, sorry, we call on uh, policymakers at all levels to take the lessons offered by our traditional TAR, you know, the poems I just, just uh, mentioned above, to heart, to recognize and promote and protect the rights of indigenous peoples so that we as societies can share in holism, balance and life. Thank you very much. And uh, if you um, have questions, I'm happy to also uh, elaborate more. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you for sharing so powerfully uh, about the situation uh, in my Myanmar. Uh, we are with you and the Karen community in solidarity. Thank you so much for your, for your, for sharing this. Our final speaker is Ms. Lizeth Escobar Alku, who is the expert documenter of the Tikuna, Kokama, and Yagua peoples in the Amazon. Uh, Lizeth, you've been working extensively with the Tikuna, Kokoama, and uh, Yagua people in Puerto Narino. In your opinion, what motivated their change of fishing techniques some years ago to the point that they almost exterminated that fish species? And how did they later combine traditional knowledge with innovation to manage inland fisheries resources in Lake Taraporto water systems? And secondly, please, if you could also talk a little bit about how to reconcile protection and fishing with Ramsa Convention protected area. Thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anandi, and thank you to all the organizers for inviting me. It's a honor for me to be here. So let me please share my screen. Are you, uh, oh my God. We can see your screen, Lizzie. We can yes. see it, Lizzie. No? Yes. Okay, nice. So to start, I want to mention, um, okay, I'm Lizzie Escobar and I'm from Colombia. I'm an economist and I've been working on the Amazon Basin uh, for six years now. And oh, I don't know what's happening here, sorry. Okay. They said just make it big in the screen. Yeah. And then and then we will, yeah, perfect. If you could make it big in the PowerPoint. I think now finally. Excellent. Okay, excellent. <laughs> now I can start. So uh, some of the contributions uh, from um Ellen Fisheries to indigenous food, food uh, people's food systems are I want to make I want to mention two important points from this side. First, that in the case of many indigenous peoples that inhabit the Amazon, we find that fisheries provide them a source of food and their main animal protein. For example, in the case of Ticuna, Kokama, and Yagua peoples in the Colombian Amazon, more than 70% 70, 70 of, the, of the protein they consume come from fishing activities. So fisheries provide them healthy diets and also more than 25% of their incomes come from fishing activities. And these incomes could be direct or indirect, being the direct, the, uh, the ones they get from uh, fishing and consuming directly the fish and the indirect from the market because of the, the incomes they get uh, in the market selling the food. So uh, considering those, considering this, I have found that direct incomes are higher for communities who live far from local markets and urban areas, or in other words, the farther they live, the more rural they are, the higher are the direct incomes. And this means that they are even more dependent of, of, of fisheries. Um, also, this is about incomes and economic dependency, but I also want to mention that fisheries play an important role on indigenous culture and beliefs, and this is absolutely related to food systems. Um, I find a good example that I want to use to explain this idea, and this is related to the Tikuna peoples. Um, it, turns out, it turns out that um, they, ha they have a story about the creation of the world, and according to it, Tikunas believe that humans come from fish. They have their own creator, whose name is Joey, uh, like their god, uh, and one day Joey went to fish and started putting the fish on the floor. And then they became humans and populate the world. And that's how they um, explain the origin of humanity. But what is the, the important point of this, of this story? And this is just a brief story. Um, 
as a researcher, I can say that uh, the moment I knew this story, but especially the moment I uh, could understand the meaning was a breaking point in my research process and also in my learning process in the Amazonia Basin, because I could understood, I could understand better and clearer the way indigenous peoples understand the world and particularly the aquatic world in the case of the Ticunas. The lesson was that to realize that fisheries mean, mean identity for, for indigenous societies in the basin. And identity is the base of a culture, which is even stronger and more complex than just understanding fishing production. And um, because it was about understanding the way they inhabit the world and the relationship with other elements of the ecosystem. And a second point uh, is related to food sovereignty. And this takes me to territorial management and practices. Since um, sovereignty refers to uh, the capacity of peoples to decide what to produce and how to produce, and both uh, determine what can to consume, inland fisheries are highly important within um, the food uh, systems of a large number of indigenous peoples, not only because uh, food providing, but because through the fisheries and its attributes, it's possible to determine how independent a community is from markets and also from governments. And it also allows us to determine how strong their own institutions are and how well preserved their practices for food production are. For example, um, in the fishery I've been working um, on, uh, ancient and some young fishermen uh, do still use arrow to catch, to catch fish, as we can see in the picture. Um, also, women do recognize which kind of fish it's good to treat specific diseases and so on. There are a lot of examples. Uh, but the point is that in fisheries, we can find their cultural heritage, which determine uh, how they manage their territories. Then moving through, through to the other uh, questions, the second question, uh, there are many drivers of change in indigenous peoples inland fisheries. So for the case of the Colombian Amazon, there are some that I have here in the presentation in the list. So I will tell like the, I will tell a, um, a little bit about the process. So um, it brings me to some of the conclusions that I have uh, after six years trying to understand this fishery and this society and their change over uh, um, almost one century. Uh, this this drive these drivers of change are related to different phenomena in different scales, from global and regional scales to local scales. So some, some of the phenomena are colon, colonization as a regional phenomena in the Colombian Amazon. And this is related to the integration of the territory of the Amazon to the nation state. This was after the Colombo-Peruvian War in the 1930s. So the main changes came after the 30s, close to the 40s, because um, those, the, the, one of the main changes was, so about, was related to social organization, because indigenous peoples were organized in communities. Before that, the idea of communities, as we know today, didn't exist. So then having communities and colonization, the cash market appears in this region. And in this context, we can identify the changes related to the way they started using and managing fisheries after, especially from the 1960s and 70s, when they started using nets. So the catches critically increased. They started going to new fishing areas to find more fish. And this is about fishing techniques. But then uh, about the use, these new production were not for self-consumption, but for providing the markets, the international markets, especially in both national and international, but especially international markets. And this generated overexploitation and directly affected indigenous people's livelihoods. And finally, and the most important point or driver, it's, it's related to the role of government as a driver uh, if we consider that for that moment, the idea of development was based on increasing production without considering sustainability as we do today. And this was a global, a, a global level phenomenon. And all this together uh, create a new scenario to set the problem about, about overfishing. And that was evident only in 20 years of change from the 70s to the 90s. But finally, um, in the 90s, uh, we started finally looking for a community-based solutions in order to manage fisheries around the world. As to management, which is a very important framework because, uh, and we need to develop, to continue developing um, this because it involves all the stakeholders from communities to NGOs, 
academic and government. But the most important about, about this kind of frameworks is that open the great possibility to hear civil society, and in this case, in the case of course, voices, and recognize their contributions on the context of sustainability and uh, at the time that we protect their rights. Finally, uh, about how to reconcile, to reconcile protecting and fishing with a, within a Ramsar, a Ramsar Convention um, protected area. The place uh, where I've been working is a, is, is a system of lakes that are really important, not only because of their uh, functions in the ecosystems, but also for people that inhabit the ecosystems. So uh, what is really important is that the change that is happening is in a global scale. So the world has started moving towards uh, sustainability, which gives us all hope because we have realized that we were not doing right before. And we are now moving towards new scenarios, more inclusive. And we are looking not only for developing economies, but also we are looking for working to ensure social environmental justice. And having said that, um, we are creating different strategies and policies in order to move towards sustainable, to us, to a more sustainable world. One of those strategies is related to the protection of, of the ecosystems around the world, especially the ones that we consider more important because of the diversity they have. And in this case, we have the Amazon Basin, which is well known as a region, mainly because of their natural resources, but also it's important to recognize their, their cultural diversity. So um, in being this region so recognized, we all want to protect this ecosystem, but I have been insisting on the idea that policies to protect ecosystems need to include peoples. And in, and in the case of the Amazon and indigenous peoples, we need to listen to their voices to, and to realize what, what are the way they want to protect their ecosystems. Because for the world, probably it's important to protect diversity and nature, but when we um, when we go to the site of indigenous peoples, we find that we find that for them, it's about living and about culture and about their identity. So finally, when we have all these stakeholders together, we need to ensure that our efforts are together going on on the new scenario of sustainability in a more include in the creation of more inclusive strategies where we all can find like a way. So the the the, the, the clue here is to. To, to work all together. And a good example is the work that FAO has been doing, as John, John mentioned, the, some examples and the big efforts that they are doing to, to bring all the ideas and, and to materialize in, in different publications and show the world how important the indigenous people's contributions are. And that's it from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lizette. And thank you for giving us an insight into your very interesting uh, research. Thank you. We will now move into the Q&A session because we are running out, uh, we are running behind time or we will shorten uh, the session. Um, I kindly request if you have a question to please raise your hand, your Zoom hand, if you would like uh, to ask the panelists a question. Uh, the to raise a hand button is on the bottom right hand uh, corner of your screen under reactions. This way I'm able to see it on my screen. Uh, when asking a question or making a comment, please identify, identify yourself, your organization, and to which speaker the question is intended for. Thank you. I open the floor for questions. Yes, Jan, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Nandi, and thank you for allowing me to ask a question. I wanted to ask uh, Anne Norgan. I, I think Anne is still with us. Um, but uh, in many ways, uh, also perhaps Frank uh, could help us with the with the answer. And, uh, and Paul, I mean, FAO has a, we've been working as an agency on fisheries for several years. And it has a very powerful fisheries uh, team and, and divisions and units. So what, what is that we could do um, differently? What could we, what, what will indigenous peoples like that FAO could do both from the indigenous peoples uh, 
unit that I in the, that I am coordinating, as well as from the fisheries division. What what will you welcome us doing differently to support your work? Um, <clears throat> this is Frank. I can I can answer. Anna, I see you just came on. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, that is, uh, thank you, John, John, for the question. It is really um, good one. Uh, I've been now comparing this uh, international year of um, uh, fisheries to this another um, uh, organization of the, for example, the UN Food System Summit. And there, for the Food System Summit, there is a clear roadmap for indigenous peoples to to uh, to prepare for the for the mm, uh, year uh, for the summit and i was thinking that maybe uh, it's possible for your two units in cooperation to make some kind of roadmap for indigenous peoples to propose and uh, uh, contact those uh, as you have now done contact those who are working with indigenous peoples who are working with fisheries and then have some same kind of rights based approach also to preparing for the next year, because as we, uh, I and so many other indigenous peoples have been stating that it's uh, the rights to use the waters, they are crucial for the our well-being. So um, uh, that would be greatly ap appreciated if we could uh, together formulate um, uh, a plan. Uh, conduct the, or um, uh, uh, to head to the next year. Thank you. Uh, I I just like to add that uh, you know in the Great Lakes, at least in Michigan and the areas where I'm I'm from, on the U.S. side of the of the border, we have the Chippewa Ottawa Resource Authority and the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. Both of them are focused on 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 uh, on fishing on the Great Lakes, and also fishing in the inland lakes area. The the ex exercising the treaty rights, and I believe that these organizations would have a lot to contribute. Uh, but they, in my reaching out to the Chippewa Resource Authority, they were unaware of this process and this project and what's going on. So I think that there there needs to be more awareness in the at least in the Great Lakes area of the United States that that this uh, what's going on with this process and i think there's opportunity for some guidance to come from these these folks that have done an immense amount of research and a lot of work in trying to help preserve not just the not just the the rights of for the fishing but also preserve the the fish for all the coming generations Thank you, Jan, and thank you, uh, Annie and Frank. Um, would anyone else like to ask a question? Please raise your hand. I can ask a question from the chat uh, in the meantime. This question is uh, for Jan uh, from Sebastian Matthew from ICSF. It will be good to know how FAO defines food systems and how do you see this definition in the context of indigenous peoples small-scale fisheries and aquaculture? Yeah. So that is a difficult question to answer. Uh, there is uh, some of the work that has been done by the high-level panel of experts defines three main types of uh, food systems, um, uh, commercial, uh, uh, modern, and then traditional. Um, the, the, the work that I'm leading in the FAO Indigenous Peoples Unit with technical divisions like fisheries, forestry, and other colleagues in FAO is that we are convinced that indigenous food systems do not fit these three definitions and that indigenous people's food systems, very much along of what Fran has taught us here today and uh, a lot, along what um, Anne and uh, Paul and, and, and other and, uh, and Alessandro have shared with us as well as Lee said, there is an, uh, an intrinsic cosmogony from indigenous peoples that see uh, a level of respect and reciprocity with the fisheries that uh, we don't see um, even in, in some of the traditional fisheries very often. So the indigenous people's food systems is extremely uh, distinct 
from other food systems and it encompasses, first it has a systemic approach on the way the, uh, the territory is managed, integrating the spirituality, cosmogony, natural resource management, as well as the socioeconomic aspect. But very important is culture, tradition, and language. And I think what we see that either language or culture uh, uh, suffers or traditional knowledge is no longer transmitted, we do see those indigenous people's food systems are deteriorating. And I think Lisette gave some examples on how when the food system uh, geared towards market, there were significant changes. The other very important um, difference from indigenous people's food systems with other definitions, at least in FAO, is the fact that they integrate both food production and food generation techniques. Uh, if we consider fisheries hunting and gathering food generation techniques, where the emphasis in the, is in the biocentrism and the capacity of Mother Earth to generate food is very different from uh, agriculture, livestock breeding, and other activities are food production. And so this is why the, the, there's not an, as, an easy answer for that question in the sense that we are supporting indigenous people's food systems because they are different from traditional, commercial, and modern food systems, even though they share elements with all of these food systems. Sorry for the long answer, Danandi, please forgive me. No, oh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask if there, uh, there are any last questions as uh, we have come, uh, we are running out of time. So I can take one more question and then we will close the event. Okay, if there are no more questions, I would like uh, to invite to the floor, Mr. Manuel Baranj. Mr. Baranj is the director of the FAO uh, Fisheries Division. Mr. Baran, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nandi. Uh, participants, dear panelists, well, what a fascinating side event. Um, I have been glued to my screen throughout, and now I have the great honor of closing it. Let me just start by thanking you all for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge in this discussion on inland fisheries. The event has provided important insights on the fundamental importance of indigenous peoples inland fisheries, not just for healthy food systems, but for healthy societies. As Mr. Etawageshik and Ms. Escobar said, the fish looks after us and we look after the fish. Your worldviews and approaches to conservation and management have much to teach us. You have highlighted the techniques you use to generate food in harmony with nature, how you combine fishing and food gathering, shifting cultivation with hunting. This combination of techniques is the basis of indigenous people's food systems. And these are the systems that have enabled you to preserve the large majority of the world's biodiversity in your territories. To all I say, gathering, hunting, fishing, and farming are integral to indigenous people's food systems. But these activities are dependent upon the collective rights and access to communal resources, including lakes, lands, forests, and seas. Many of us often talk about food production, but not often do we see food systems across the planet as food generation systems. This difference between food production and food generation must not go unnoticed. I have to say that we are seeing a change in perception. Problems remain for sure, but we are all coming to realize that healthy and well-functioning ecosystems are central to food security and that biocentrism the ethical point of view that extends inherent value to all living things can be a powerful tool to address, for example, the effects of climate change, as Dr. Dora and Mr. Twa and others demonstrated today. One of the main characteristics of indigenous people's knowledge is its holistic dynamism, developed by hundreds of years of observation, adaptation, and oral transmission from one generation to another. This knowledge is like a large library which we cannot lose as we face the growing threat of climate change. I want to acknowledge that indigenous peoples led research, advocacy, policy and customary governance are increasingly recognized in fisheries management, despite the many challenges that remain. More transdisciplinary, holistic and collaborative approaches are needed. And this requires broader and more fundamental changes enacted by concrete and achievable actions from states, from policymakers, and from fisheries stakeholders. It is in this context that I referred, I referred to a political declaration approved by the FAO Committee on Fisheries in February this year, where the members of FAO committed to promote policies that support 
and recognize the contribution of small-scale fisheries and aquaculture to food security, to employment and to income, and call for improvements in data collection systems, especially from small-scale and artisanal fisheries, which obviously include indigenous peoples. Furthermore, I want to celebrate the work done by indigenous peoples and the Global Hub on Indigenous Peoples Food Systems in drafting the white paper WIPALA on Indigenous Peoples Food Systems, which has been referred to in today's presentations. This paper provides evidence-based information about the sustainable and resilient elements of Indigenous Peoples Food Systems. Inland fisheries are one of these elements and the great system of knowledge of Indigenous Peoples around it too. The recognition of these food systems as a game-changing solution for the UN Food Systems Summit will be key to preserve and to promote these knowledge systems and ancestral fisheries practices. As you know, the UN declared 2022 as the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture under the lead of FAO. The UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues is part of the International Steering Committee of this important event, and the Global Action Plan for the year, which was just endorsed by this committee, includes specific reference to Indigenous peoples. I invite you all to creatively contribute to ensuring that the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture becomes a milestone for raising the visibility and increasing the understanding of Indigenous peoples' inland fisheries around the globe. And with that, Anandi, I thank the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues for organizing this event, to all the speakers for your insights, and to all of you for your attention. Have a very good day or night, depending on where you are, and please stay safe. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Mr. Varand. And uh, with that, uh, before we close the event, we would like to take a group photo. So if everybody could please turn on the cameras. My colleague will, will take the photo. I would like to give my sincere thanks to all the speakers for your time and wisdom uh, shared today. It has been an enriching experience and we look forward to continuing these dialogues. Um, uh, I would like to also thank Paul, especially we've kept him past midnight uh, in Thailand. So thank you, Paul, for, for making the effort to stay, to stay up for this event. Um, I would also like to thank my colleagues, uh, Louisa and Michaela, especially who has been helping me with this, uh, with this side event, and to Jan and Nicole for their guidance. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Good night. Good night. Bye.